Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm very well aware of the fact that I'm the last thing standing between you and the happy hour. <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep this as short, fun, and interesting as much as I can. Um, I'll take a minute to introduce myself um, and my role just to kind of put in context of what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. So I'm Hirtal, and I lead the consumer and corporate uh, insights practice at iHeartMedia. Um, if, for those of you who are not familiar with iHeartMedia, we essentially are, our assets sit within four big buckets. Um, we own, own about 850 radio stations across the US. Uh, we have an iHeartRadio app, which has about 100 million registered users. Um, we do about 20,000 events uh, locally and nationally, some big tentpole events that you see on TV, um, uh, like iHeartRadio Music Awards, iHeartRadio Music Festival, or some smaller uh, local events as well. And last but not the least, we also, are, we also own Clear Channel Outdoor, which is a lot of billboards that you see around, right? So we basically play in buckets like broadcast radio, digital radio, events, you know, sponsorship, and last but not the least, location data from outdoor and billboard. So as you can imagine, the problem I deal with is slightly different. I have way too much data on my hands. Um, and that's a good problem to have, nevertheless challenging. It's challenging from the standpoint of how do you, A, connect the dots across all different, um, all different buckets. And when I say different from the standpoint of traditional radio is a 100-year-old medium. So imagine the measurement that came with something that was invented before internet existed. And that to be coupled with a digital medium like radio, which uh, with digital radio, where everything is available based on cookie data. So you have, uh, you have a client and you're trying to sell this thing which was 100 years old where I can say I can only deliver X and Y, and this is this new shiny tool, I can give you 100 million things, but it's, the target is this small. So constantly what I'm faced with, and going back to my role, is my alternate um, uh, title is the chief storyteller. What I have to do is come up with, on a big picture, on a big scale, from a corporate standpoint, a story of who we are and how do we sit in the marketplace currently versus our competitors in the radio space. Are we a radio company? Are we an audio company? And how do I use and fuel data to tell my story? And so what you're gonna notice uh, in terms of the stories that I'm about to share with you today, they might be a little bit too, I've tried to make them um, as specific as possible so you guys understand how data is fueling those decisions or those stories, but sometimes might be too big pictures. So with further ado, I'm gonna start with this. Um, so, you know, there is no dearth of data, like I mentioned, and everyone, you know, because of the fact that data is the new oil. Everything has to be data focused, everything has to be data driven, um, data first, and so, you know, it's a good place to be in because I think we have the seat at the table. Uh, but at the same time, um, as people in the organization understand the importance of data and want to rely more and more on data, uh, they don't necessarily know what to do with that data. They want data, they'll say I need data, but that, that's about the question that is, I need a story, but what kind of data, who are you talking to, why do you need this data? Um, so I know every organization kind of, you know, organizes their hierarchy slightly differently. In terms of data and our organization sits in these five big buckets. So the way we organize this is we have consumer and neuroscience insights. Uh, second is analytics, first party as well as third party. Third is social data. Um, fourth is bunch of syndicated data all the way from Scarborough, MRI, um, Comscore, you know, all the tools out there. And last but not the least, big data. So these are the five buckets or key functions in which the current research structure sits. And 
given that there is all this intelligence around our broadcast users, app users, um, you know, people who come to our events, how do you navigate all this data has been, has been a challenge. I've been at iHeart for about five years and I'm still continuing to, um, you know, uh, figure this out. And as they introduced me saying, I'm gonna help you make sense of the data, I can't make any promises, I'm still, it's a work in progress. Uh, so this has been my mantra uh, in terms of approaching this problem. And I call it the three Ps of data. The first one is product. The, the first year, year and a half that I spent here was starting to get together. What, what are all the pieces of data I have? Where does it all sit? How can it all come together? So what is getting all your data in one place? The second was process. And this this took a little bit of um, self-teaching. This, this, this came, um, at the knowledge um, or like, uh, like an epiphany that made me realize that I have to not let perfect get in the way of good. There is so much changing in the data world right now that if you sit and wait for the perfect solution, we're never gonna make it. We're just gonna sit in that one spot. So it was, it was extremely crucial for me to realize that I may not have the solution, the perfect solution that I'm looking for, but I have to embrace what I've got and move along and chug along. And thirdly, people. I've had to hire people who nobody went to go to school for. You know, like nobody, I, 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 two years ago, when, or three years ago when they started to launch the first um, music awards, uh, my CEO said, we're gonna do social voting. And, and I had no idea about, except for having a Facebook account from myself and a Twitter account from myself, I had no idea how to measure social. I didn't, I didn't study that, I didn't have education on that. Um, I had to go figure out how to do that. But what I realized was that you can't really hire for skills. You have to hire for passion. You have to hire for attitude. And I've had people who've gone and figured stuff out because what I knew three years ago is something that I'm not using today. And so these are the three fundamental units which kind of have helped me get to, get to the point of making sense of this data. So having set the context with that, I'm gonna take a few specific uh, examples and case studies to talk to you guys about um, how I've taken few data pieces across the different five functions that I spoke to you about and actually made a business decision or impacted a business decision. So one of the, um, so one of the ways, so going, still continuing into the, in the, in the social media space, right? Um, we have a very interesting relationship being a radio company with the artists. So, you know, the artists that, think about the first time at, before the Spotify world. Think about the first time, um, you know, you heard about an artist or you got to know about Taylor Swift or you got to know about a new artist. You hear a song over and over for a few number of times on the radio and then you go, yeah, that sounds familiar. So that's how artists kind of, you know, get popular. The less known artists slowly, slowly start to, the promotional power of radio gets them to uh, known and being familiar. And so we have this really interesting relationship with artists and so we've started to leverage that relationship and take it from the traditional radio world onto the social media and digital world. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, the, second, uh, the second engagement that I'm gonna to touch upon was actually a very, very interesting um, activation that we've done in the social media space. Um, this is to do with the iHeartRadio Music Awards where we were the first awards to say, let's have people vote on the different nominees and decide the winners instead of people sitting in a room and casting a vote on who should be the best uh, pop song of the year, who should be the best collaboration of the year. And so we took voting on different categories and nominees onto the uh, social media space. And thirdly, um, Taylor strategies to different mediums. Uh, there are so many newer mediums that come like, you know, five years ago, I'm assuming, yeah, the Snapchat, right? So there are newer, newer social media. It's not enough to know Facebook, not enough to know Twitter. While there are the bigger ones, you'll start to see there are younger and smaller and newer platforms. So it's constantly, you have to evolve yourself to be there where your audiences are. So I'm gonna quickly um, skip a few, okay. 
So with respect to the first one, so what we came up with was um, we took a bunch of social listening data from um, syndicated tools to understand that our engagement on Tuesdays was the lowest of all weekdays. And so we were trying to increase our engagement on Tuesdays um, um, on certain uh, networks. In this particular case, it was Twitter. So what we came up with was, so this was based on a data point that was noticed when we were doing some kind of analytics to understand you know, patterns across different uh, social networks. And we came up with what was called as, and I don't know if you guys have ever seen this on Twitter, but it's the I Heart Radio Twitter Tuesday. What we do is different artists on Tuesday for 30 minutes will take over our Twitter iHeartRadio's official account, and you're able to tweet your questions to that particular artist, and then that artist writes back to you. So that's a two-way communication between a fan and an artist. So you remember back in the days, you can call into the radio and talk to the person. So we took that traditional radio interaction, two-way communication, and put it on the social media space. What was fantastic about this was, there, you, the fan would call the radio station, talk to the artist, and back. It was a two-way communication. We took that two-way communication, put it on the social media space, and so now what happened is, if a Ryan Seacrest is writing back to a fan, all the other followers of the fan and Ryan Seacrest's fan are able to write back on that chain. So from a two-way dialogue, we went on to what's called the Omnilog. We created these conversations between different people uh, that were not even a part of the original conversation. And so that's a much deeper level of engagement that the social media was able to bring to the table versus what we were doing earlier. Um, so that's just an example of that. <clears throat> um, similar to that, um, we are, again, in the, in the vein of you know, redefining our relationship with artists, we are coming up with creative and different ways of how we can help artists launch their new albums, singles. Um, and what Sean Mendes, uh, we did an uh, exclusive release of his single. And um, this, this example was a full day takeover for Snapchat because he resonates better with younger audiences. Data shows us that 80% of our Snapchat audience, so iHeartRadio is on Snapchat Discover, that's the place for brands on, iHeart, uh, on Snapchat, um, and 80% of our audience uh, in the Snapchat Discover is between the ages of 12 and 17. And so inform, use based on that data point and what Sean Mendes' manager wanted to resonate with in terms of a um, target audience, we recommended that partnership for him to take over our Snapchat channel for the day and do an exclusive release of his new single. So that's where you'll see that. And Elvis Duran um, improved that. Um, and so now moving on to the second piece uh, of actually fueling social voting for an awards, um, for an award show. We came up with a strategy to say, you know, everybody was talking about influencer marketing in, uh, in the social media space. And we say, you know, people hire influencers to uh, talk about your brand, to, you know, further evangelize your brand. We said, why don't we start there were five uh, fan-voted armies that were created, looking at different cohorts within the social media space, looking at um, the number of engagements, how people, you know, who, uh, what artists are they related uh, with or they are actually fans of, and we created ambassadors who then acted as um, further fueling. So to give you an example, I'm going to do a better job at this one second. So. Um, Arianators, right? So we, for Ariana Grande's fan base on Twitter, the name that was that we came up with was Arianators. What that does is there was there was a group of eight to ten girls and boys that were fans of Ariana Grande, and they tweeted and retweeted and created this engagement of voting, ramping up things like, oh, this is the last day to vote. Let's get her on there. I want her to win. And so we created a fan ambassador for each of the five artists that were nominated, and they were almost pitting against each other to create that level of voting and engagement for their own artists. 
And all those five bra five brand ambassadors were then invited to the award show. And the one the one that and then we were measuring the voting at the back end. So through a social media listening tool, we were able to count the number of votes based on the dedicated hashtag that they used to vote. And then they were given an award uh, for the most amount of votes that were created for that artist during the show by the artist. Um, so this was an example of, of actually taking your influencers from your own fan base, from your own fans and followers on the iHeartRadio page versus finding a new paid influencer to do this kind of push for you in the social media space. Um, and then <clears throat> this was, this um, to go back, this actually happened because this was rooted in the idea of a piece of work that I had done earlier in the year, which was a primary research uh, study, a consumer insight study, where we did some generational work for Gen Zs, millennials, so on and so forth. And one striking thing that I've actually heard in, in a couple of talks this morning, too, uh, in um, Mike's uh, keynote this morning, saying, you know, not only build for your consumer, but build with your consumer. And so what you see about Gen Zs and millennials is that they love to co-create. They love to have AC. They don't want to be recipients of culture. They want to be culture creators. They want a voice at the table. They want to be a part of the strategy that you're crafting for them. And so you'll see that for Gen Z and millennials, they want it to be a part of the process. And, and taking this insight, we actually came up with the idea of doing the um, fan ambassador for awards. Um, that's just talking about the best fan army, and that's how it was created. So it was believers, directioners, and harmonizers. Those were the three that were created. And you'll see those were the ambassadors that were selected. So they would go on Twitter. They would ask their fans and followers to go and ramp up their voting. And last but not the least, um, you'll see, like I was mentioning, there are new and emerging platforms. So in your social strategy, you know, be mindful of including the new emerging platforms and don't focus all your energies on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and the reason these three strategies worked is because there was a core defining consumer insights that defined each of those. So in, in, in the first one, there was, there's a core need of connection between fans and an artist. And we took that and we created a dialogue, to a dialogue to an omnilogue. The second one around fan ambassadors were like the younger generations, like Gen Zs and millennials. They like influencer, they like to be influenced, but they also want to be influencers themselves. Um, and um, uh, in terms of the more emergent platforms, uh, they have an expectation to be live and relevant. If you continue to keep pushing your content out on just Facebook, very quickly you're going to start losing younger audiences because they've started to associate that with older audiences. Um, and I'm going to. And so that was one example of how Consumer Insights focused few initiatives within the business, especially in the social space. The second one that I'm going to quickly talk through is um, how we are starting to take our digital and broadcast data and, and starting to merge the two. So like I was saying, radio is a 100-year-old medium. And uh, dig uh, digital radio has enough uh, data. However, their targeting or the size is much smaller compared to radio. Radio reaches 93% of America in a given week, right? Um, so it has huge scale. Um, and so what we've started to do, but it has its restrictions given it's, it's a, you know old medium, so you have to still rely on Nielsen and their PPM meters uh, to give you any sort of, any sort of measurement. What we were able to do is a form of um, look-alike modeling. We took a bunch of people from our digital 100 million red users. We mapped their listening habits onto to the broadcast radio listening habits and created these cohorts because digital has changed the way, um, I'll jump one more to talk about this, because, um, Digital has changed the way people are buying media now. Even for traditional mediums, now buying is based on cohorts and kinds of audiences, different types of audiences. So for those of you who are familiar with media, usually radio or television gets bought on, I want 18 to 34, prime time, uh, AM drive, a PM drive, but those days are gone. Now you want someone who is an auto intender, was planning to buy a car in the next six months. 
So to be able to give that level of granularity of data to radio or broadcast radio, how do you go about that? So we came up with a lookalike modeling based on our digital data because uh, we are able to look at our 100 million red users and map them back to our on-air listeners based on demographics and certain other uh, criteria. Uh, we are able to create cohorts which can then be served up um, from a programmatic standpoint um, and then they can also be optimized in real time. We are spearleading this for the industry. Um, uh, iHeartMedia is doing that and other players are starting to embrace that as well. So my last parting words for you guys are gonna be, um, and this I'll give the credit for this to Jonathan Mendenhall, who used to be the ex-CMO of um, Airbnb. He said, don't let your strategy be data-driven, because when you get your strategy data-driven, you leave no room for surprises. What consumers want is delight. What consumers want is surprise. So let it be data-inspired. Use your data. Use your data, but leave a little room for surprise in there. So that's all I'm gonna leave you guys at. Any questions? <laughs>